first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here, and also thanks for the invitation. So today I'm going to talk about uh, recent work with my collaborators. Uh, Dr. Chu Taiping currently is at the university, uh, Duke University, and uh, also my colleague, Ke Wang, he is also uh, from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And uh, my talk is on the singular vector of matrix denoid model. So this is going to be a, a mathematics talk and uh, uh, specifically on the field of for the random matrix theory. So actually the model, a matrix denoid model originates from a lot of uh, applied fields. So, uh, but unfortunately I'm not experts on this uh, field. So I will just simply treat it as a mathematical problem. But in case you know some nice application, you should let me know after the talk. All right. So, uh, so by random matrix, we mean that the uh, matrix uh, has some uh, uh, random variable as its, co uh, co uh, as its uh, 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 matrix entries. And uh, so we usually consider a region when the dimension of the matrix is very large. So we basically consider some limiting uh, statistic properties of some uh, numerical characteristic of the matrix. So here we consider the limiting property of the uh, singular vectors for this matrix model. So let me start from the definition. And uh, so the matrix denoting model in the literature is also usually called the signal time <coughs> noise model. And uh, I denote it by Y, which is a rectangle matrix T times N. And it consists of two parts. So the first part is a determinist matrix A, so which is usually uh, called as a, a signal matrix. And the second part is a random matrix, in the sense the entry of this matrix is a random variable. And uh, so the practical meaning of this a, uh, these two matrices is that uh, uh, usually this A contains some information of interest. So we want to know some uh, uh, thing about this A. However, the data we get is uh, this matrix Y. So this uh, uh, data is sort of polluted by the noise A. So the primary interest is to recover the information about the signal matrix A from the polluted matrix Y. All right. And uh, so usually, uh, in the high dimensional case, you cannot do that in general. Uh, however, if you assume some uh, special structure uh, of this matrix space, for example, if you assume it is a low dimensional, and uh, then it is possible to a certain extent. So we assume uh, this A to be a low rank, and uh, it's, uh, specifically it admits a so, uh, single validity composition as the following. It can be written as a product of a K by K matrix, and uh, K by K matrix, and uh, K by N matrix. So this D consists of the so-called singular values, and this U and V consists of the left and the right singular vectors. So uh, we can also write it as a sum of K rank one matrices, and this D I so they are just the singular values, and the U I V I they are the left and the right singular vectors. And I also assume this K to be fixed. So here by low dimensional I mean this uh, uh, dimension is fixed, which will not grow along with N. And also I order the singular uh, uh, the singular value. Uh, in such an order. And in practice, you can regard this VI as uh, some uh, uh, sort of strength of the signals. And this UI and VI they consist of uh, some structural information about the signal. So the primary interest, of course, is uh, uh, to get some information about this DI, UI, and the VI. Because if you know all of them, then you just uh, recover the matrix A. And also, in some other cases, this DI, UI, and the VI they have independent interest. So we would prefer to start with them uh, separately. Uh, instead of uh, starting the matrix A as a whole. All right, so this is a sort of the uh, goal. And usually, uh, we assume the uh, noise matrix uh, as a following. So we assume the entries to be independent, but we do not assume they, uh, uh, they are Gaussian distributed or, or and, uh, something like that. We assume the noise to be generally distributed, and the expectation are zero. And we also normalize the entries of the matrix in such a way that the variance is 1 over n. So uh, actually, the xij, they are also independent. So you should really think of it as xijn. And uh, so this means that the entry of the matrix is typically of the uh, size 1 over square root n. So if you uh, square it by square root n, it will become an order 1 random variable. And we further assume all the moments of uh, this order 1 random variable exist. But so this condition can be significantly weakened. We only need uh, the existence of uh, finite uh, moments. But I'm not going to pursue this direction. And the third, we consider the standard uh, high dimensional setting of random matrix theory. We assume P is independent, and both of them will go to infinity in such a way that the ratio of P and N will go to some constant. And uh, actually, we can consider some more general setting 
For example, you can also consider the setting that both P and N are very large, uh, but P divided by uh, divided N goes to zero or in infinity. So this uh, we can also do. Uh, but let me just keep the setting uh, to be simple because this is a, a typical setting considered in random regression theory. Okay. So now in practice, uh, as I said, this A is our um, major part. This is a source of our objects, and we should really think it is as uh, the whole model is a uh, perturbation of these signal matrix. So this Y is a sort of a perturbative model of a deterministic matrix, which itself is random. However, from a theoretical point of view, especially from random matrix point of view, we should really think, of, think this X to be the main object. Because if you study some uh, limiting behavior in probability, of course, uh, the, the resource of a randomness is more important. So we really think the matrix A, X is our main object, and we think the whole model is a fixed rank perturbation of the random matrix. Okay, so now the uh, goal is, uh, is the following, because what we want to know is the singular value and the singular vectors of this A, and the very nature estimates for them is the corresponding counterparts of this Y. So we can also compute the singular value and the singular vectors of Y, and we check whether they can estimate this D, I, B, and D, Y. All right, so, uh, uh, so in order to understand the limiting behavior of the singular value and the singular vectors, of this y, we should first understand the limiting behavior of the singular value and the singular vectors of this noisy matrix. And as I said, this is a major part from the mathematical point of view. So let's first see what's the result of the uh, limiting singular distribution of the singular values and the singular vectors. So I denote the singular uh, values of a matrix by sigma 1 to sigma t, and which is just the eigenvalues of the square root of r r star. And uh, so now we have uh, uh, p numbers, and if we want to know some uh, uh, statistical behavior or distribution of this n real numbers, the simplest way is to consider the so-called histogram. You just uh, draw the histogram, and the histogram will tell you how this n numbers distribute on the real line. And the histogram is nothing else, it's just the so-called empirical measure. It puts a 1 over p to every number, all right? Uh, but here, for simplicity, Instead of considering the single value, I consider the square of the single value. And essentially, they are the same. If you know the distribution of the square of single value, of course, you know the distribution of the single value. It's just a simple change of variable. Right? Now, if you take the matrix to be the pure noise matrix X, it is a well known that this empirical single value distribution will go to some deterministic measure called the matrical positive distribution. And uh, the distribution is given as a following. So this is say, remember, it is a ratio between P and the N. So the result depends on the ratio P divided by N. And if uh, this C is uh, uh, larger than 1, then you get a pure point mass at 0 of size 1 minus 1 a reciprocal of C. And if C is uh, smaller than 1, then the uh, measure limiting distribution of single parts law is absolutely continuous. And the support is compact, and the two end points are given by lambda minus and the lambda plus. So this measure basically tells you the limiting behavior of the distribution of n singular uh, p singular values. It tells you that how this uh, n singular value distributes on real line. And then from uh, this results, you can uh, uh, it's very reasonable to guess the limit of the largest singular value because the right end point of the distribu empirical distribution is lambda plus. So it's very reasonable to guess that the largest singular value goes to lambda plus as well. But unfortunately. Actually, from the matrical past the law, you can get, cannot get a such a convergence because uh, in the um, empirical single value distribution, every single value only occupies probability 1 over p. So even when you have some abnormally large single value, for example, if sigma 1 is a 10,000, this guy anyway will only occupy probability 1 over p. So it will not affect the limiting behavior of the empirical measure. So that means, actually, the limit of this mu x will not tell you the limit of the larger singular value. So indeed, it requires uh, an independent result for the binding law. This is also a very famous law. And the binding law tells you that, actually, the convergence is uh, indeed true. So the larger singular value will indeed converge to this lambda plus, although the, re uh, the result cannot be read off from the machine compass law directly. Okay. So now these are the uh, results about the uh, singular value for the pure noise matrix. Then we can ask the counterparts for the source of the fixed rank perturbation of the noise matrix, which is uh, 
our matrix of Y. This is a nice data matrix. Okay, so again, the limit of this new one which is a uh, empirical singular value distribution of the noisy data matrix Y will be the same as the limit of mu x because mu y is um, y is just a fixed rank perturbation of x and the fixed rank perturbation in random matrix we are uh, theory is that we are know that it will not affect the limiting distribution of the empirical singular value distribution so again this limit of mu y will be identified with the limit of mu x and then you can ask the question about the limit of the larger singular value uh, unfortunately, in the case of the large singular value, things may be quite different. So you can think about an extreme case. So for example, if the fixed rank matrix A here, if I take the D1 to be extremely large, again like 10,000, and this X is a, a random matrix whose large singular value goes to the so-called lambda plus. But if this D1 is extremely large, even when K is a fixed rank, the large singular value of the noisy matrix Y very likely it will be very similar to the large singular value of this uh, uh, fixed determinant matrix A. All right. So that means, although the matrix A is fixed rank, if the signal strength is very large, it can indeed affect the largest singular value of the matrix Y. And uh, so here comes uh, the result. If I decompose the matrix Y and also by singular value decomposition, and I denote the singular value by S1 to SP and I order them in such a way then this UI hat and the VI hat they consist of the, the left and the right singular vectors and the, here comes the result of the first order limit of the largest singular values so here I say for any fixed I you can simply consider when I equal 1 so that means it's the largest singular value and the, actually the convergence quite much depends on the strength of the signal so if the strength of the signal is smaller than or equal to some threshold, which is called C to the one quarter, then actually the large single value of this noise limit matrix Y will still go to lambda plus. So remember that lambda plus is actually the limit of the large single value of the pure noise matrix. So that means even if you have a signal, if the signal strength is not sufficiently large, actually the limit of the largest single value of the noisy data matrix Y will be the same as the pure noise matrix. So that means from the data matrix, you actually cannot get any information about the signal DI, right? Because your goal is to recover DI. However, in the limit of SI, you don't have any information about DI. It is the same as the noise matrix. So that means if the signal is not sufficiently strong, the signal is just covered by the noise. You cannot get any information from the data. All right? However, once the signal is larger than the threshold, say to the one quarter, indeed, the large singular value of the noisy data matrix will go to some function of the DI, so which is defined in that way. So that means if DI is larger than the threshold, you can indeed recover the strength of the signal from the counterpart of the noisy data matrix one. Okay, because you can solve the equation, and once you get SI, then you can get the DI. So you get the data, then you compute the large singular value from the data matrix, and then if you are in this region, you can in, indeed recover the uh, strength of the true data, which is uh, the true data, which uh, is just the matrix A. Okay, so this is a result about the uh, first order limit. But then you can ask a further question, so this is uh, uh, the limit of the large singular value. Then how about the fluctuation, right? If you subtract this SI by the limit and do some rescaling, then what's the distribution of uh, uh, this guy? Okay, so this is a second order convergence. And uh, unfortunately, uh, this result has never been fully stated in the literature. So some partial results can be obtained in this paper. However, although the result is not uh, uh, available from the literature, it is very easy to predict the result for the fluctuation of the large single value in different regions. So the supercritical and the critical or supercritical region, because the result is well known for some uh, very similar models. So here are two analogous models considered in random matrix theory. So the first model is called a spike covariance matrix, and the second model is called a deformed Wigan matrices. And both of these two models, they are sort of fixed uh, rank deformation of some classical random matrix model. And the similar phenomenon will happen for the eigenvalue of these two matrices. And in, especially in this famous paper, 
uh, by Baker, Benelux, and Fisher uh, for this slight covariance matrix, which has discovered that if the signal is smaller than the threshold, then the distribution, the second order fluctuation of the largest eigenvalue or singular value will be the same as the fluctuation of the pure noise matrix. And the distribution is the so-called tracy widen distribution. And then once the signal is larger than the threshold, and it turns out that the fluctuation of the largest eigenvalue or singular value is Gaussian. So for this five covariance matrix. And uh, it's the critical region. So if the strength of the signal is exactly critical, then the fluctuation is a mixture of the tracy widen and the Gaussian. So the uh, people believe that similar results should hold for these uh, singular values of the uh, metric noise model as well. And uh, it's, it's worth noticing that in these two papers about the form of Wigan matrix, and uh, they started the so-called uh, supercritical super region. So for our metric denoising model, it means the signal is larger than say to the one quarter the threshold, and uh, they discovered the so-called non-universality phenomenon for the fluctuation for distribution of the eigenvalues. So in our case, it is a singular value. So non-universality will mean that the limiting distribution will depend on the distribution of the noise matrix and also the structure of the signal. So uh, in statistical physics, universality means that, that the limiting behavior will not depend on the details of the model. This is just like the central linear theorem, which does not depend on the distribution of individual random variable. But the non-universality tells you that actually the distribution of the large singular value will depend on the distribution of the noise matrix and the, st uh, the structure of the U and the VIs. Okay, so now here uh, are the results of the singular values. Then we turn to the uh, results for the singular vectors. So again, you can ask what's the limiting behavior or what's the limit, limit or limiting distribution of the singular vectors. And we have the left and the right singular vector for this noise data matrix, which are denoted by the ui hat and the vi hat. But first of all, it is not a well-posed question uh, uh, to ask for the limit, limit of a p-dimensional uh, vector, because the p itself will go to infinity. So you cannot ask for the limit behavior of a, uh, random, of a random vector whose dimension itself will go to infinity. So instead, we do not study the limit of the whole vector. Uh, we will focus on the projection of the vector on two certain direction. Okay, because the uh, projection of the random vector on certain direction is still random variable. So you can consider uh, all kinds of direction. You can project this ui hat and the vi hat to certain direction and study the limit and the limiting distribution of uh, this uh, inner product of the ui and some other direction. However, the most interesting case is that the direction is given by the true signal. Because if you consider this inner product, if this inner product is close to 1, then that means this ui hat is basically the same as ui. So remember, our goal is to recover the structure of the signal, which is basically the ui and the vi. And if the inner product itself is already 1, then that means the ui hat and the ui they are the same. All right? And the ui hat is what you can compute from the noisy data matrix y. So that means if you compute the uh, ui hat, and if the limit is 1, then you can use ui hat to estimate the ui, all right? And if this inner product goes to 0, then you cannot do that. And if this inner product goes to some other number which is between 0 and 1, that means ui hat contains some partial information about ui. So the results, again, depend on the strength of the signal. So if the signal is smaller than or equal to the threshold, it turns out that the inner product will go to 0. So what does that mean? So ui hat is what you can compute from the data, all right? And now you want to know something about the true signal ui, and this result tells you that ui is actually living in the orthogonal complement of ui hat. But the ui hat is from the p-dimensional Euclidean space, and the ui hat itself is one-dimensional. So the orthogonal complement is p minus one-dimensional. And this result tells you that ui can be any vector from this p minus 1 dimensional space. But p minus 1 dimensional subspace of uh, rp is still a huge space. All right? So basically, you don't have any information about ui. So that means, actually, in this case, if the signal is not sufficiently strong, you don't get anything about this true signal ui from the noisy counterpart in your head. Right? And uh, in the case when the signal is larger than the threshold, the inner product will not go to zero, but it will also not go to one. 
instead it will go to some number which is between 0 and 1. So that means this ui hash is actually living in a sort of a cone around this ui. And uh, this guy instead uh, indeed they give you partial information about the UI, although it cannot be used to recover the whole UI, right? And also notice that if you send the signal strength to infinity, this ratio will really go to 1. So that means if the strength of the signal is sufficiently strong, you can indeed use UI hash to estimate the UI. But if the UI is not sufficiently strong, you only get partial results instead of the full information of the UI. Okay, so here is the first order limit about these uh, singular vectors. And then you can ask what is the fluctuation of uh, this inner product around the limit. Right? So this is again a second order uh, fluctuation question. And here comes the result. And this is also the result of our work. So it turns out that uh, I just take this vi, the right uh, singular vector as an example. The result for the left one is analogous. And, uh, if you subtract by the, uh, the inner, uh, inner product by its uh, first order limit, it turns out that the order of this difference is of order of one square square. So you scale it back by square square, then it becomes an uh, order one random variable. And actually, in a weak sense, this order one random variable distribution is almost the same as distribution of a sum of two random variables. And these two random variables, they're independent, and one of them is Gaussian and the other is uh, given by that guy. This x is our noise matrix, and the u and the vi, they are the left and the right singular vectors of the two data matrix, a signal matrix. So uh, here are also some parameters like u, a, i, v, i, and sigma i square, and they can depend on the uh, moments, third moments, of, uh, and the fourth moment of the uh, noise. And I'm not going to show all the detail, but uh, this result tells you that actually the limiting distribution of the projection can be non-Gaussian. So it consists of two parts. One is Gaussian, and the other is not necessarily to be Gaussian. And I can give you more details on the so-called non-universality. So we can consider some special case. So the first special case is if the noise itself is Gaussian, then the part Ci, which is actually the linear combination of the noise matrix, is of course, again, a Gaussian, a Gaussian variable. And the Gaussian plus the Gaussian, and they're also independent, so it's again a Gaussian, right? So in this special case, you need to get a Gaussian distribution. In the second case, if x is general, which may not be a Gaussian, but if the structure of u and v, they are so-called delocalized. So in random matrix theory, delocalized means that the components, none of the components of the vector u and v can be dominated. So in the sense, all the components, they are uh, a little o of one. So none of them can be significantly larger than the other. So it, it will not be something like a standard basis, like one zero zero zero. So in that case, we call the vector as a localized. So if all the components, they are sort of negligible, then we call the vector as delocalized. So an extreme case is if all the components are one of the square square. Okay, so both of them are assumed to be also normalized. And in this case, you can again consider this guy. So this part is, in general, is not necessarily Gaussian. However, if the infinite norm of U and V, they are negligible, then this guy is again a linear combination of the entries of the noise matrix X, but the coefficients, they will go to zero. And then by the central limit theorem, we know this guy is again asymptotically Gaussian. Okay? So in this case, again, Ci plus epsilon i is a Gaussian. So in this case, uh, the distribution of the projection is again a Gaussian distribution. However, now if we, if we turn to the following case, if X is generally distributed, and the U and the V, they are so-called partially localized. So you can consider the extreme case that the U and the V, they are standard basis, like 1, 0, 0, 0. Okay? And in that case, you do not have central limit theorem for this periodic form. Because in that case, this guy can be only one entry of X. It could be X11, one, one, all right? And of course, the distribution will depend on the distribution of x. So in this case, you get a convolution of some general distribution and the Gaussian distribution. So this is what we say by non-universality. Actually, the limit distribution of the uh, singular vector could depend on the structure of u, v, and also the distribution of the noise matrix x. All right, so this is uh, uh, our result. And uh, here is a sort of uh, extension of uh, the result of the singular vectors, it is uh, uh, the distance of the two 
a singular subspace spanned by the singular vectors. So we have a true uh, matrix V, which consists of the right singular vectors, and we have a noisy counterpart, which consists of the first k right singular vectors of the noisy data matrix Y. And then we consider the borrowing quantity, which is a double sum of all inner products like that. So what's the meaning of a practical meaning of this quantity? We can first fix with i and consider sum over j. So for example, if we have already considered the uh, inner product of vi hat and vi, which tell you the uh, size of the projection of vi hat uh, onto its uh, deterministic counterpart vi. And the result show that uh, the projection will not be exactly one. So that means there's some information of vi hat are shared by some other direction. So that means you can also tend to study the projection of vi hat onto some other direction, which is given by vj. J may not be exactly the same as, one, uh, as i, right? So now if you fix this vi and you sum up the uh, projection onto all vj, then that means the projection of vi hat onto the subspace spanned by all vj, right? If you further sum over i, that can be regarded as a distance for the projection of one subspace onto the other subspace. So this quantity is a standard quantity to uh, characterize the distance or angles between two subspaces. So one is spanned by the V and the other is spanned by the noise counterpart of V hat. So this quantity can be used for some sub singular subspace inference. And again, we get some similar linear distribution for this guy. And again, it consists of two parts. So one part is Gaussian, and the other part may depend on the structure of the vector and the noise matrix. And so uh, these are sort of the, the result. And, uh, and uh, I still have a few slides on the uh, technical proof, but I think uh, maybe we're not so interested in these uh, things, so let me just uh, skip them. And uh, uh, thanks for your attention. Uh, I have many questions, okay. but then uh, I will uh, limit to one or two. So yeah. the first thing is, um, I think uh, so many uh, data uh, data mining uh, uh, algorithm require a calculation of eigenvalues. Yeah. And uh, if, can you uh, give us some uh, some 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 application of your result in that aspect? And also uh, the other questions I want to ask mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, is is the mathematics uh, easy to generalize to, for example, finite field or some? Uh, uh, finite field, I haven't considered that, but I think it, it, it could be possible. But maybe the own methodology leverage could be quite different. And on your first question, and uh, as I said, unfortunately, I'm not an expert on the five fields. Actually, one of my collaborators, uh, uh, Dr. Xiu I think he is uh, currently taking charge of uh, looking for some applications, and we are working on this part. So probably I can answer your question in the future, and uh, if you're interested, you can communicate by email. Great, so I'm looking forward to, uh, to that. Uh, any other questions from the audience? 